The world can be a scary place. It's wise to learn a little self-defense. For some people, that merely amounts to being so nice that nobody would want to hurt you. But other people go a very different route. These are the most effective martial arts in the world. Number 20. Kung Fu Kung Fu is a broad term for Chinese martial arts such as Wushu and Quan Fa. It's a term used in China to describe any study, learning, or activity that needs patience, energy, and time. In recent times, Chinese martial arts have spawned the Kung Fu film genre of cinema. Bruce Lee's films were pivotal in the first success of Chinese martial arts in the West in the 1970s. Bruce Lee was a legendary international celebrity who promoted Chinese martial arts in the United States. Martial artists and performers like Jet Li and Jackie Chan have helped to keep this genre's popularity alive. Jackie Chan was able to successfully incorporate a sense of humor into his fighting technique in his films. That's right, Bruce Lee was a kung fu expert, and I think it's safe to assume if he were still living today, he'd be able to kick your butt. No one can beat a kung fu master, and this is why. Kung Fu comes in a variety of styles and is practiced all over the world. Each style of Kung Fu has its own unique set of concepts and methods, although it is most recognized for its deception and speed, from which the term Kung Fu is derived. The Chinese community just began to use this phrase in regard to Chinese martial arts in the late 20th century. Martial arts also play a significant role in the wuxia literary genre. This kind of literature is based on Chinese chivalry principles, a separate martial arts society, and a primary martial arts subject. Wuxia stories date back to the 2nd and 3rd centuries BCE, gaining popularity during the Tang Dynasty and eventually developing into novel form during the Ming Dynasty. Like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Taekwondo Taekwondo is a Korean type of martial arts that emphasizes head height kicks, leaping spinning kicks, and quick kicking techniques. Kicking, punching, and the art or way of are the literal translations for Taekwondo. Taekwondo practitioners wear a dobok, which is a type of uniform. It is a fighting sport founded by Korean martial artists with expertise in karate, Chinese martial arts, and indigenous Korean martial arts traditions such as Tekken, Subak, and Guanbop in the 1940s and 1950s. New martial arts schools known as Kwans began to appear in Seoul in 1945, immediately after the conclusion of World War II and the Japanese occupation. Due to years of decline and suppression by the Japanese colonial administration, indigenous disciplines were all but forgotten at the time. Traditional Taekwondo is a broad word that refers to the martial arts practiced by Kwans in the 1940s and 50s. While the term Taekwondo had not yet been coined at the time, and each Kwan was practicing its own distinct fighting style. Nowadays, it's considered to be one style. Taekwondo has been one of three Asian martial arts to be featured in the Olympic Games since 2021, making it an international sensation since its inception. Number 18. Combat Sambo Sambo is a Soviet martial art, a widely practiced combat sport, and a recognized type of amateur wrestling competing alongside Greco-Roman wrestling and freestyle wrestling at the World Wrestling Championships. Sambo is a relatively new system, having been developed in the early 1920s by the Soviet NKVD and the Red Army to improve the servicemen's hand-to-hand -hand combat ability. It was created as a fusion of the most efficient techniques from several combat systems. Viktor Spiridonov and Vasily Oshchepkov were the forefathers of Sambo. Oshchepkov lived in Japan for several years, studying judo with Kano Jigoro, the inventor of the sport. After being suspected of being a Japanese spy, Oshchepkov perished in jail as a result of the Great Purge. In 1969, the inaugural Sambo World Cup was held. Then, in 1975, Don Curtis, a member of the United States Olympic Wrestling Committee, claimed that the Russians would include Sambo wrestling in the 1980 
the Olympics program in Moscow. However, Sambo was relegated to a demonstration sport at the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow, USSR due to political issues arising from the 1980 Olympic boycott, which arose following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Because of the sport's strong ideological ties to the Soviet Union, it was eventually stripped of its demonstration status. Number 17. Karate Karate is a Japanese martial art that originated in the Ryukyu Kingdom. Under the influence of Chinese martial arts, notably Fuji and White Crane, it evolved from indigenous Ryukyuan martial arts. In 1879, Japan's empire seized the Ryukyu Kingdom. Karate arrived in the Japanese archipelago in the early 20th century, at a period when Ryukyuans, particularly from Okinawa, were migrating to the major islands of Japan in search of work. The adoption of the white uniform, which consisted of the kimono and the dogi or keikogi, most commonly referred to as just karategi, along with colored belt grades, contributed to the modernization and systemization of karate in Japan. Jigoro Kano, the inventor of judo, was responsible for both of these advancements. Following World War II, members of the U.S. military learned karate on Okinawa or in Japan, and subsequently started schools in the United States. In Phoenix, Arizona, Robert Trias launched the first school in the United States in 1945. Through popular culture, karate expanded quickly in the West. Karate was presented in near-mythical terms in 1950s popular literature, and it was plausible to portray Western figures in unarmed combat as oblivious to Eastern martial techniques of this type, like it was some kind of superpower. Number 16. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a ground fighting and submission hold based martial art and combat sport. It emphasizes the ability to take an opponent to the ground, dominate them, acquire a strong position, and employ various techniques to force them to submit, such as joint locks or choke holds. After Brazilian Carlos Gracie was taught conventional Kodokan Judo by traveling Japanese judoka Mitsuyu Meda in 1917, brothers Carlos, Oswaldo, Gasto Jr., George, and Helio invented Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu around 1920. Later, they created Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, their own self-defense method. Through the inventions, practices, and adaptations of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and Judo, BJJ ultimately evolved into its own distinct combat sport and became a crucial martial art for modern MMA. BJJ is based on the idea that a smaller, weaker individual may effectively defend themselves against a bigger, stronger, heavier opponent by utilizing leverage and weight distribution, bringing the fight to the ground, and defeating them with a variety of grips and submissions. Sport grappling and self-defense scenarios can both benefit from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu training. Sparring, sometimes known as rolling in the BJJ world, and live drilling are important parts of the practitioner's training and development. BJJ may also be utilized to promote physical health, character development, and as a way of life. Number 15. Marine Corps Martial Arts Program MCMAP the Marine Corps Martial Arts Program is a fighting system designed by the United States Marine Corps to integrate current and new hand-to-hand -hand and close-quarters combat methods with morale and team-building activities, as well as warrior ethos education. The program, which began in 2001, teaches unarmed fighting, edged weapons, weapons of opportunity, and rifle and bayonet tactics to Marines and U.S. Navy sailors assigned to Marine units. It also emphasizes mental and character development, such as the use of force responsibly, leadership, and collaboration. MCMAP evolved from the martial talents of Marine boarding parties, who often had to rely on bayonet and cutlass methods dating back to the formation of the Marine Corps. These bayonet methods were augmented by unarmed fighting techniques during World War I, which were frequently beneficial in trench warfare. The slogan is, One Mind, Any Weapon, and it emphasizes both mental and physical power. Individuals who have demonstrated extraordinary service on the battlefield are the focus of warrior studies, as well as debate and study of combat citations. The study of martial culture focuses on communities that generate soldiers primarily or entirely. The Marine Raiders, Spartans, Zulu, and Apache are amongst the martial civilizations examined. Marines may learn basic tactics and strategies from the past by studying these civilizations, and they can reconnect with the Marine Corps' fighting mentality. Number 14. Muay Thai Thai Boxing 
Muay Thai is a martial art and combat sport that incorporates stand-up hitting and clinching techniques. Because of the simultaneous use of fists, elbows, knees, and shins, this discipline is known as the art of eight limbs. Muay Thai gained international acclaim in the late 20th and early 21st centuries when westernized Thai fighters competed in kickboxing and mixed rules bouts as well as Muay Thai bouts all over the world. Muay Thai's origins may be traced back to the 16th century when it was used as a peacetime martial art by King Nerusan's warriors. Simon de la Lubert, a French ambassador dispatched by King Louis XIV to the Kingdom of Siam in 1687, witnessed and reported on a Muay Thai show. Muay became a sport in which the opponents battled in front of spectators who came to watch for enjoyment, as well as a practical fighting method for use in actual conflict. Muay bouts were an increasingly important feature of local festivals and festivities, particularly those conducted at temples. The combatants, who had previously fought bare-fisted, began to wrap hemp rope around their fists and forearms. Number 13. Sea Lad Silat is a name that refers to a group of traditional martial arts from Southeast Asia's Nusantara and neighboring geocultural zones. Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Southern Thailand, the Philippines, and Vietnam have all practiced it in the past. There are hundreds of various styles and schools of martial arts, most of which focus on blows, joint manipulation, weapons, or a mix of the three. Certain rituals may be performed to mark the initiation of a new pupil. Fasting for a few days or drinking herbal tea are two examples. Silat Lad masters have never charged fees for their instruction, although the ambitious student can donate money or another gift. These rituals are no longer often used, especially outside of Southeast Asia, but they are nevertheless well preserved in Indonesia, as seen by the fact that a few Silat schools, such as Silat Lintar, maintain its unique initiation rite. Silat first appeared in black and white Indonesian and Malay films in the 1950s. During the 1950s and 60s, Malaysian studio Shaw Brothers and Cathay Chris created more than 40 successful films incorporating Silat. They had very little choreography planned ahead of time, and they were never marketed as action or martial arts films. As a result, most actors at the time had no prior training in Silat, resulting in what are now widely regarded as inadequate representations of the art. During the 1970s, however, Silat grew more important in Indonesian cinema, resulting in more professional and genuine representations of the art in both historical and action films. Ratno Timur and Advent Bangun were well-known Indonesian action heroes in the 1980s Silat flicks The Devil's Sword and Malaikat Bayangan. Number 12. Arnis Arnis is the Philippines' national martial art. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting, joint locks, grappling, and weapon disarming methods are all part of Arnis. Although weapons are often emphasized in these disciplines, certain systems emphasize empty hands, and some old-school systems do not teach weapons at all. Because Arnis was primarily a poor or lower-class art, most practitioners lacked the intellectual knowledge required to establish any form of written record. While this is true of many martial arts, it is especially true with Arnis, because its past is nearly entirely anecdotal, oral, or promotional. The origins of Arnis may be traced back to local Pintado's combat tactics used by numerous pre-Hispanic Filipino tribes or kingdoms during battles. While the contemporary version includes Spanish influence from ancient fencing that began in Spain in the 15th century. Other influences include the impact of Silat as well as Chinese, Arab, and Indian martial arts brought by immigrants and traders passing through the Malay archipelago. Despite the fact that Arnis integrates local fighting tactics with old Spanish fencing and other influences, it has evolved into a distinct Philippine martial art throughout time. Because the arts were taught informally, there were no established belts or grading systems. Declaring a learner a master was seen to be ludicrous and a virtual death sentence, as the individual would be challenged to possibly deadly duels left and right by other Arnisadores trying to make a reputation for themselves. It's best to keep your actions as low-key as possible in this martial art. Number 11. Balintowak Eskrima Grandmaster Venancio Anciong Bacon founded Balintowak Eskrima or Balintowak Arnis in the 1950s to strengthen and maintain the combative element of Arnis, which he thought was becoming watered down by other types of Philippine martial arts. It was founded on a tiny street in Cebu and is named for it. The Dosi Pares Club, made up of Eskrimadors from the Saavedra and Kate families, was founded in 1932. Lorenzo Saavedra was in charge of this. Venancio Bacon was a founding member of 
the Dosi Perry's Club and one of its most talented boxers. Grandmaster Siriako Kakoi Kate revealed in an interview for Bladed Hand, a Filipino documentary on Filipino martial arts, that Bacon was one of the finest fighters in the Dosi Perez Club. During the 1950s and 60s, escrimadors from several camps, namely Dosi Perez and Balintowak, put their talents to the test in all-out challenges, sometimes by agreement and sometimes by ambush, which frequently resulted in injuries and, more rarely, fatalities. Venancio Bacon was ambushed while walking to his house in Labangan in the dark, and he murdered his assailant by cracking his spine. Bacon was convicted and sentenced to prison, with the court reasoning that Bacon's fighting abilities may be deemed a lethal weapon that should have been handled with caution. Bacon returned to Cebu and Bolintowak after being released on parole in the mid-1970s. He did not return to leadership, but he did attend Jose Vilasin and Teofilo Velez's training sessions on a regular basis until his death a few years later. Number 10. Rough and Tumble Rough and Tumble, also known as gouging, was a type of combat used predominantly in rural areas of the United States throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. It was usually used to resolve disagreements and was commonly defined by the goal of gouging out an opponent's eye, but it also encompassed other cruelly disfiguring tactics, such as biting. Though gouging was popular in southern colonies by the 1730s, it had faded by the 1840s, when the bowie knife and gun had made frontier conflicts even more dangerous. Despite the fact that it was never an organized sport, fighters would occasionally plan battles, and winners were hailed as local heroes. Gouging was essentially a form of duel to preserve one honor that was most frequent among the impoverished in the late 18th and early 19th century, especially in southern regions. When a disagreement emerged, competitors might choose to fight fairly, that is, according to Broughton's rules, or rough and tumble. This combat technique was distinct because it placed a premium on deformity and the amputation of body parts. In the midst of the chaos, gouging out an opponent's eye, like the knockout punch in contemporary boxing, became the essential condition of victory in rough and tumble fighting. Of course, the finest gougers were also skilled in other forms of combat. Some people are said to have filed their teeth in order to more effectively bite off an enemy's testicles, ears, lips, or nose. Nonetheless, freeing an eyeball rapidly became a fighter's most reliable path to victory and most coveted achievement. Number 9. Volley to do. Volley to do is a full contact unarmed fighting sport with few regulations. The name means everything goes in Portuguese. During the 1920s, fighting sideshows known as Vale Tudo were popular in Brazilian circuses. Vale Tudo remained mostly an underground subculture from 1960 onwards, with the majority of fights taking place in martial arts dojos or tiny gymnasiums. The Vale Tudo subculture was centered in Rio de Janeiro, although numerous bouts occurred throughout the country, particularly in the northern, southern, and Bahia states, where capoeira is popular. The heated competition between Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Luta Livre dominated the scene in Rio de Janeiro. Other areas' fights included a wider range of martial arts fighting in their competitions. Vale Tudo festivals continue to be held in large numbers around Brazil today. However, because of the sport's brutal and gory nature, these underground tournaments can attract media controversy. Critics of the sport say that all Vale Tudo events should follow the MMA Unified Rulebook developed by athletic commissions in the United States and implemented by nations such as Canada and England. Supporters of Vali Tudu, on the other hand, oppose the unified rules, claiming that there's no medical evidence that they're safer. Number 8. Ninjutsu Ninjutsu is the martial art technique and tactics used by ninjas in unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare, and espionage. Spying has been practiced in Japan since the 6th century. Shinobi were assassins, scouts, and spies who were usually employed by territorial rulers known as daimyo throughout history. Despite their ability to murder people while basically invisible, their primary function was that of spies and scouts. Shinobi are known for their stealth and deception abilities. They'd utilize this to avoid direct conflict if at all feasible, allowing them to dodge large numbers of opponents. Ninjutsu was created as a compilation of basic survivalist tactics throughout medieval Japan's warring states. In a period of terrible political unrest, the ninja used their skill to protect their lives. Ninjutsu includes information collecting tactics as well as non-detection, evasion, and diversion tactics. Free running, disguise, escape, concealment, archery, and medicine were all part of ninjutsu training.
Espionage and assassin skills were extremely beneficial to feudal Japan's warring factions. The abilities of espionage were known as ninjutsu at some time, and those who specialized in these jobs were known as shinobi no mono. Number 7. Line L-I-N-E stands for Linear Involuntary Neurological Overriding Engagement. Line is a close quarters fighting technique adapted from several martial arts that was used by the U.S. Marine Corps from 1989 to 1998 and later by U.S. Army Special Forces from 1998 to 2007. The system was created to be used in very specialized and demanding combat situations. All methods must not be vision dependent. They need to be usable effectively in low light or other low visibility situations such as smoke or gas. They must also be implemented when exhausted mentally and physically wearing full battle gear and the methods must kill the opponent. They must also be useful by and against either gender. These parameters are thought to be the most likely conditions that a combat marine or soldier would face in close range combat. That, because most close combat engagements take place at night or in low light, while the Marine is fatigued and wearing his combat load and when facing asymmetrical odds, such as a numerically superior force. Many showy techniques, unique kicks, and motions demanding incredible feats of strength or agility were ruled out of the line system due to these restrictions. Techniques such as basic judo hip throws, for example, were prohibited due to the risk of entanglement on the practitioner's war belt. This is a system all about efficiency and making a kill when everything's going against you. Number 6. Krav Maga Krav Maga is a military self-defense and combat method designed for the Israel Defense Forces and Israeli Security Forces that incorporates techniques from boxing, wrestling, judo, aikido, and karate. Krav Maga is noted for its great efficiency and attention on real-world scenarios. It was inspired by the street fighting experiences of a Hungarian-Israeli martial artist Imi Lichtenfeld, who used his boxing and wrestling expertise to defend the Jewish quarter of Bratislava, Czechoslovakia against Nazi gangs in the mid to late 1930s. Following his relocation to Mandatory Palestine in the late 1940s, he began teaching combat training to what would become the IDF. Krav Maga's initial goal was to take the most effective and practical methods from various fighting systems, primarily European boxing, wrestling, and street fighting, and quickly teach them to military conscripts. Krav Maga is based on an aggressive philosophy that emphasizes simultaneous defense and attacking actions. The Israel Defense Forces, Special Forces, Security Forces, and regular army units have all employed Krav Maga. Israeli law enforcement and intelligence agencies have created and adopted closely comparable versions. Several groups teach Krav Maga in various forms all through throughout the world. Number 5. Jeet Kune Do Jeet Kune Do is a hybrid martial art that is highly influenced and developed by martial artist Bruce Lee's own philosophy and experiences. <laughs> Bruce Lee created Jeet Kune Do based on his experiences in unarmed combat and self-defense. Lee had first studied and investigated numerous styles of martial arts before formalizing Jun Fan Gung Fu in 1962. However, after his confrontation with Wang Jack Man in 1964, Lee saw the folly of tying oneself to a systematized martial art and renounced Jun Fan Gung Fu. Following this, Lee decided to devote himself to research and practice in order to improve his martial arts technique. He introduced the core philosophy of Jeet Kune Do in 1965. Lee claims that his method does not build a system by layering more and more items on top of each other, but rather by selecting the finest amongst them. Lee utilized the image of repeatedly filling a cup with water and then emptying it to describe his concept of throwing aside what is unnecessary, which he derived from Chan Buddhism. Unlike more conventional martial arts, Jeet Kune Do is a philosophy with guiding ideals rather than a set or systemic system. Jeet Kune Do's practitioners believe in little effort with maximum effect and high speed and are named after the fencing principle of intercepting or attacking when one's opponent is ready to attack. Number 4. Sistema Sistema is a martial art from Russia. Following the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, several schools of systems arose with teachers claiming their own systems. The Americans, an FX cable series about two Russians disguised as an American husband and wife pair during the Cold War in the 1980s, began using Sistema methods in its battle choreography in 2013. In preparation for his major part as a London banker pulled into the brutal world of the Russian Mafia in the 2018 BBC crime thriller Mick Mafia, 
actor James Norton learned components of Sistema with David Kirilov, who leads the London School of Sistema. Lamar Houston of the Chicago Bears has also utilized Sistema in his preparation. Colleen, the protagonist of Capcom Street Fighter V, and Marie Rose, the protagonist of Koei Tecmo's Dead or Alive 6, both have a Sistema fighting style. The combat technique of the Black Widow trained assassins in the 2021 Marvel Cinematic Universe film Black Widow, starring Scarlett Johansson, was based on Sistema. Number 3. Okichita Okichita is a martial art that integrates the Plains Cree First Nations combat tactics. George J. Lapine, a Canadian martial artist, defined and taught it. Lapine, the style's founder, studied traditional wrestling, tomahawk throwing, and hand-to-hand -hand combat tactics as a child. He also studied judo, taekwondo, and hapkido, among other martial disciplines. Okichita was created and launched by Lapine in 1997. George Lapine is a Plains Cree chief from Manitoba who grew up learning traditional hunting and tracking techniques. Techniques. Traditions of combat methods were also passed down to him by his elders. Because of the importance of weapons in hand-to-hand -hand methods, weapons training is introduced early in a student's training. The gunstock, battle club, and the long knife are the major weapons of the Okichita martial arts style. Much of the training is centered on one-on-one -on -one fighting, as it is in many martial arts. The attacker starts the fight by posing a physical threat with simple weapons such as a tomahawk or knife strike or a punch. The student displaying the technique reacts to the attack by stepping into the attacker's area and completing the method with a mix of blocks, strikes, grips, rolls, or throws. The name Okichita is derived from the Plains Cree word Okichitawak, which refers to an accolade bestowed by elders to Cree warriors when a younger man has shown himself in combat. Okichitawak was a term used to identify community warriors who had honed specific talents for survival, protection, and battle. Number 2. Kolari Peya 2 Kalari Peya 2, or simply Kalari, is an Indian martial technique that evolved in modern-day Kerala. India's southwesternmost state. Within Indian martial arts, Kalari is noted for its lengthy history. With a history extending over 3,000 years, it is said to be India's oldest surviving combat art. The Vadakam Patukal, a compilation of songs written about the Shekavar of Kerala's Malabar area, mentions Kalari Peya 2. The main concept of Kalari, according to the Vadakan Patukal, was that knowledge of the art should be employed to serve honorable objectives rather than one's own selfish purposes. Kalari, like other Indian martial systems incorporates Hindu ceremonies and ideas. Medicinal therapies are also based on notions from the Ayurveda in ancient Indian medical literature. Warriors in Kerala, unlike elsewhere in India, came from all castes. Women in Keralite culture were also trained in Kalari, and they continue to do so now. Keralite women, such as Uniyarcha, are honored for their martial ability in the Vedak and Padukal, so this is a martial art that anyone can master. Number 1 Dombi Dombi is a Nigerian martial technique used by the Hausa people. In a normal bout, competitors try to subdue each other into total submission in three rounds. It frequently ends in major bodily damage like broken jaws and ribs for the challengers. The Hausa word Damanga is used to describe boxers. The Hausa fishermen and butcher caste groups dominate the practice, which arose over the previous century from clans of these professions visiting agricultural communities around harvest season and incorporating a combat challenge by foreigners into to local harvest festival entertainment. Many of the practices and vocabulary allude to battle, and it was originally used as a way for men to prepare for war. Companies of boxers now travel across the traditional Hausa homelands of northern Nigeria, southern Niger, and southwestern Chad, conducting outdoor contests surrounded by ritual and drumming. The sport has received widespread attention from Nigeria's Federal Ministry of Youth and Sports Development, with Minister Sunday Dare pledging in December 2019 to establish a National League and collaborate with the Dombi Sport Association to form a federation to organize competitions and tournaments across and outside the country. These plans were already in the works before the COVID-19 pandemic struck the country in early 2020. I don't know about you, but I had no idea you could take down a person with so many different techniques. What about you? Which is your favorite martial arts style? Tell us about it. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.